uh, what day is it? It's Wednesday. <laughs> Wednesday, the, I'm telling you, you, you lose track of what day. I know it's Wednesday, but the date is May the 13th, and we are so excited for you to be here on Rubyville Alive. God is good to us, giving us another beautiful day to worship him. And guess what? The weatherman says it's going to get a little warmer. So we're all saying praise the Lord for that. Don't have to cover up our maters, right, in the evening. So thank you for joining us. Levi Nelson's back with us. And we're excited about that. And uh, all three of us are excited. We've got some good hands. I'm kidding. We appreciate Levi. He's been such a blessing to us. And uh, Jody Hanna's going to be singing for us here in just a little bit. And Pastor Cal will be preaching. Uh, we're going to sing a song that's not in our hymnal uh, here at the church, but it's in the regular church hymnal that many of us grew up in. And it's 333, a very familiar song, I'll Fly Away. Most everyone knows that. So we're going to sing that together tonight. Word. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to my home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. favorite songs of our dear pastor friend that is now in the presence of Jesus. We had a dear pastor friend, Pastor Denver Daniel of the Christian Unity Church in Grafton, Ohio, make his crossing last night. 
and I just had to sing that in his memory, and we want to pray for his wife, Norma. Uh, they loved our church, and they loved, they loved your pastors, and we love them so very, very much, and so thankful. We're happy for him. Our hearts are broken because we miss these ones that have, that have passed on from our presence, but I'm so thankful we have a hope. Amen. We have a hope tonight. Let's join me in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you again for all that you do for us. Lord, we, we wake up every morning and we count our blessings. Uh, you, you've given us another opportunity to worship tonight. And with our, there will be thousands of people that will be worshiping at home tonight. And what an honor and what a privilege it is. Uh, there's many options for people to choose to live stream uh, during this time, and we are thankful for those that have chosen to take the time to join us here at the Rubyville Community Church. We pray for Jody tonight, that you would anoint her, anoint her voice, Lord, and, and, and anoint the words that she'll be singing, and they'll be ministering to people. Pray for Pastor, Lord, tonight, anoint him. Lord, we know your word is already anointed, and so we just pray that you would touch our hearts and our ears and our minds, that we can receive what you have for us tonight. And Lord, if this be our very last time to worship, before we meet you, that will be just fine. Because, Lord, it seems like the day, the more that we live, we have more over there waiting on us than we do here. But, Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, that we have that glad reunion day coming soon and very soon. Be with those in our church that are going through times of sorrow right now. And, Lord, we know that they are doing that and their hearts are broken. But, Lord, we're so thankful for the comfort and the peace that only you can give. Bless us now, we pray, and we'll praise you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Make welcome Jody Hannah. She comes and sings for us. Just so you 
Hallelujah. I don't know how it feels in your home, but I tell you, God's filled up Rubyville Church with his presence and power tonight. Thank you, Jody. And uh, this is Spring Jubilee. So Jody got to sing at Spring Jubilee. Uh, this would be the week we normally would be over at the fairground. And uh, the Lord said he had other plans for us. And we know God's had his hand on so many things and we're thankful for his blessings and his watch care and we're thankful for you and each one of you and what God is doing and we're, we're just looking to the Lord to do even greater things and I think we're, we're coming so close, so close to the coming of Christ. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6 and keep your Bibles open. I'm going to look at just a few verses here out of the 6th chapter of Matthew. I've been going to the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapter and dealing with a series of sermons uh, out of these, how special that we are, the eyes of God, and how God is training his disciples. And we need the training of the Lord as well. While you're turning there, I do ask that you continue to pray uh, for the family of Alice Spradlin. Of course, Alice went to be with the Lord. My, what a great, great Christian lady. Faithful to this church since its beginning days, and uh, she was always faithful here until the last few years of her life where that she's uh, just been practically shut in and been out at Elbrook and they've taken such good care of her there, her and her dear family. But this is so hard on the family considering that in just a short span, all during this time of pandemic, they've had three deaths now. And I hope you'll continue to pray for Pam and Paula, also Ron and Don Buckle, all of their family, all of the family members, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. She lived a remarkable life, and we know she's with the Lord, and we just ask that you pray for them, and God will continue to comfort them during this time. Your prayers are so appreciated. Well, I'm going to look, uh, I don't know, I hope maybe at least, at least two more sermons, if not three, dealing with this particular passage of Scripture. This is the Sermon on the Mount, preached on the horns of Hatin, and there is Jesus preached this and taught this, and I don't mean to be repetitious, but we have new folks joining us constantly all across the country and around the world. But we know that this Sermon on the Mount is not the same as the Sermon on the Plain. The Sermon on the Plain is in Luke 6, and we know when Jesus had come down off the mountain into the plain, he taught that, that lesson to his disciples, repeated a lot of this. But at that time, I believe he had 12 disciples in this event, with the Sermon on the Mount, while he is still on the Mount, he is teaching possibly six of his disciples at this time. I don't want to take the time historically and biblically to tell you the basis of that. Uh, you can trust me on it, look it up yourself, and that's a good study for you if you want to, but I want to get right to the heart of what God has laid on my heart. If you remember, I dealt first with the fowls of the air and the lilies of the field and how that dealt with the city of Sephorus or Sephorus, both is the same, uh, just different pronunciations, and how that city had been destroyed when Christ was just a young man, only four miles from Nazareth, and you could see the ruins of that city. Later it was built up again, but during the time ahead of that, it was known as one of the gems of the Orient of the Mideast and how God had prospered it. It was a sanctuary city, but yet through the zealots coming in and when they overthrew the armory and then of course when Rome sent in uh, Varus and that is Quintilius Varus or Cyrenius Varus 
Quintilius, Cyrenius is the same name. Don't be confused because in history it just has to do if it comes from Latin roots or, or Roman roots or ancient Greek roots. And sometimes the same name is just translated into other languages. And it's important that you know that. If you remember when that city was destroyed, that day, depending on what historical account that you read, there was probably at least 2,000 of the Jews alone, not counting the other residents of the city because it was a multinational city. 2,000 were crucified there in that area of Sephoris and also in the area of Damascus. And they were trying just to put fear into people saying don't rise up against the Roman Empire. So they sent in Cyrenius from Syria and he came in to stop that. And of course he destroyed the city. When he destroyed the city, he not only destroyed it, he salted the, salted the ground so nothing would grow. And that's the miracle. Lilies grew where nothing could grow. And he also had a ditch dug around it, a large ditch that was dug around with sulfur rock in it because uh, there in the area, Hatin itself is an extinct volcano. There's a lot of sulfur rock. They filled up that big ditch, lit it, and it sent up sulfuric smoke into the air so birds wouldn't fly through. He said, I don't even want a bird to fly through the air in this area. It's cursed. But God separated that and made channel ways for the birds to fly through. And what he's saying is if God can create a place for lilies to grow where they can't grow, and if God can make a place for birds to fly where they can't fly, how much more does your heavenly Father care for you? And we left you with that. Then on Sunday night, I dealt with the salt of the earth, and uh, I'm not going back into that tonight, but I want to read just a few things to you, maybe pull just a few thoughts out as time permits tonight. Look at verse 19 of chapter 6. 19 of chapter 6. Bear in mind now he's still sharing this, this whole passage at the time where undoubtedly he's referring to the ruins of Sephora because that made such an impact on all of the people that were in that area. They could still see the ruins and they saw the power of, of the empire and they saw how that they would stop at nothing to destroy and to take and to kill and to steal. And that was, their, that was their protocol at that time. They taxed the people, burdensome taxes, taxed everything, every way that they could. They'd find a new way to tax them, tax them for everything from their belongings to their income to what they had when they died to even fishing. They would tax them in any way that they possibly could. And they would have taxes added to taxes because each new ruler that came in found a new way to tax. And then they would hire the Jews to tax the Jews. So the end result was they would add something to that. That's why tax collectors were so hated in the times of Christ because they were really like traitors. They betrayed their own people. And because of that, there was great, great fear for the things that they worked for and the things they accumulated. So what they would try to do is they would try to hide their wealth if they could. They would hide what belongings, what money they had and they would try to store it in a safe place because they knew that if the Romans found out they had it or even if other Jews found out, they could turn them in to these collectors and the end result was they could lose everything. So they found places to hide it. Oftentimes, the places were not safe because there was humidity, there was moisture, and because of that, we know that it would often destroy some of the valuable things that were there. So they were constantly in search of a place to hide their belongings. And that's what they had in their mind. When Sephora's happened, people lost everything overnight. In one day, everything that they had worked for was gone. They had labored for it and suddenly they no longer had it. I think a lot about what Bob Pelfrey tells me about his dad, Trim. When the Great Depression came, he had, was it 24 or $28 in the bank? Uh, and Bob's told me many times his dad never got that money back. He had it in savings. He never got it back 
but he never forgot that he lost it. And that's the way they were. They had lost that and they had never forgotten what had happened at Sephora's. So they kept looking for safe places to try to hide what little bit that they had. They're just looking for a safe, doesn't that sound familiar? Everybody's trying to find a place of safety right now. But yet we have an enemy that would love to find where that we've hidden things and try to put things because he'd love to take everything that we've got. With that in mind, this is what Jesus said. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. Notice the next part. And where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. And where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be be also. Let me stop right there. We'll look at some other verses in a moment. What he was saying is, if you're looking for a safe place to hide something, a safe place that you don't have to worry about losing the value of it, I, I'm amazed when this first started, the pandemic, I, uh, I was at the bank one day and when I was there at the bank, uh, that's before they closed the lobbies. And as I stood there in the bank, I watched a man beside of me get everything that he had in that bank out in cash. And I, I told, I, I couldn't help but think, I was telling some of them in the office about it after it happened. One of the last things that the clerk said, whatever you do, find a safe place for that. And he said, well, it's not safe in a bank because I'm afraid that we're not going to be able to have currency before long. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to find a place to get it. And, and I got to talking to the teller there. And there had been a run on the bank. People trying to get their money out of the bank. They didn't even feel the banks were safe through all of this. And we look for a place of safety. We try to find an area where the, I've heard people say, if I can find a place where this virus doesn't come, that's a safe place and I'm going to move there. They're looking for a place of safety. And they never forgot what happened at Sephora. And they lost everything. This in the town, right beside of the town that Jesus grew up in. And he never forgot that. But Jesus said, let me tell you, you can look this earth over and there's no safe places. There's no safe place that the enemy won't figure a way to get into. There's no safe place that the thief won't come and try to take it away. And if he can't get there, he'll send something else by nature to try to destroy what's there. But Jesus said, by the way, I know a safe place. I know somewhere that you can lay up something. And when you lay it up there, there'll never be a devil get in to get it. There'll never be a thief that will take it. Inflation won't cause it to lose its value. There'll not be anything lost. That place is heaven. We ought to have more stored up in heaven than we ever have stored up on this earth. So people are looking for a safe place. Not only that, but then he reminds them of the fact of the time that they were living in. And it seems like he suddenly changes direction in the middle of this. In verse 22, he says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be, what's the next word? Single. If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be what? Evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for, he, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will love the one and, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So he goes right back to the same thing at the end of it. But in the meantime, he uses an unusual phrase here. I, for years, I, I wasn't troubled by it. I was curious by it. What did he mean by being single eyed? Having a single eye. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to keep both my eyes. But suddenly he's talking about one eye. Well, the first thing comes to mind, it's simple, and it's not that it's incorrect, but the first thing we would say is he's talking about being focused. But by the way, sometimes if 
you don't have both eyes on the same object, it can be hard to be focused. So it has to be more than that. And really it goes back to the word that he used there. The word single eye in the Greek is a word that's called haplus. Haplus, when I read it, it didn't mean anything until I started doing some study on the word to find where that root word came from. It's a military term. Haplus came from a group of Persians that were known as the Aparus. The Aparus were strange warriors. They weren't a paid professional military. They were citizen soldiers. Everyday people, farmers and citizens that signed up to fight in battles when needed to be fought. But they were actually more feared than the professional militaries of the Persian and the Greek Empire. The Greeks picked up from the Persians on this technique. You see, uh, the, the Aparus, which later became the Hoplus or the Hoplites, they, uh, they, they fought in a different way. Since they weren't trained military, they didn't follow military ethics. There was a time in history when wars were fought ethically. I know that sounds crazy, but uh, you, you know it's when they broke that compassion. Even in war there was compassion. That's why God had such, such a, a great, great anger toward the Amalekites. Because the Amalekites, if you remember, the, the, the Jews... They put their, the children of Israel, they put in the back behind the army, they put the children and the feeble and the elderly and the people that couldn't fight. But the Amalekites didn't meet them head on. That's how armies fought at that time. They, they approached one another, they sized one another up and they attacked head on. But the Amalekites didn't do that. They went to the hinder parts. They went around them, flanked them, came in and ambushed them. And they ambushed the helpless. They ambushed the elderly. They ambushed the children that weren't soldiers. And through that, they were able to overcome the Israelites. And God never forgot what they did. Now, the professional military people, they wouldn't fight that way. They had rules of engagement, if you will, how that they would fight. And those rules were not to be, not to be stepped over or crossed over. Just like I know that they haven't followed it in wartime, but we have Geneva Convention that sets rules for war, wartime, how prisoners were supposed to be treated. We know they weren't treated that way, but yet they had guidelines for that. Well, since this Aparus or Aplus, they, they came in to fight, they didn't know anything about military tactics. They fought, uh, let me put it this way, one is like military or boxers fighting in the rings. But Haplus fought like street fighters. They, they didn't fight fair, not fight fair at all. In fact, they were more feared than any group, any group in all of the world at that time. Do you know why? It's the way that they fought. They used archers, and these archers... Uh, you know, they, when archers, it wasn't uncommon to have archers, but most archers would draw back and they would have a single eye. You know, if you've ever shot archery, you, you aim at your target. You know you don't use the tip of the arrow just to say where I'm looking at, that's where the arrow's going, but you focus on your target. And then with wind, velocity, other things, you determine how high you need to go above that bullseye or how much wind there is, how much to the right or to the left that the arrow could go. So you single eye it when you fight. That, that's how their archers would operate. A plus didn't do that. They would fire as many as three arrows at one time. And to make matters worse, they would have no fletching. That meant no veins, no, no feathers on the arrows. See, that's what guides the arrow. That helps to guide an arrow when you shoot that arrow. They would strip one of the fletching off or one of the veins off or feathers off or maybe two off or maybe have none at all. And when they shot, 
they may look over here, just pull back and turn loose. And the arrows, when they go three at a time, you couldn't defend yourself because they would go everywhere. They weren't focusing on a target. They were just shooting, hoping to hit something. And because they fought that way, you couldn't properly defend yourself. And Jesus is referring to the fact that don't you be like that group of people in your life that you do not have a focus on God and a focus on spiritual things and a focus on heavenly things. You don't run through life just ram shot and say I'm just going to do the best I can. Take a shot at it and I hope it hits something. You might hit something but you might not like what you hit. There's great danger in that. It's almost as foolish as pointing in the air and shooting an arrow and watching it go up and come back down, maybe on your head. It's dangerous. You don't do that. And because it's so dangerous, they had fear of that. Jesus said, now listen, don't run your life trying every way to get to heaven and trying to focus on every religion and find out how many different ways there are and how many different things you can do. You stay focused on me. That's what Jesus is saying. If you're going to make it through this, you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. If you don't keep your eyes on Jesus, you'll lose your sense of direction. You'll not know where you're going and you'll get confused. So stay single high. Are you done or can I give you one more? I'll give you one more real quick. This is another one that always troubled me. Troubled me not that I doubted it. Troubled me because I didn't understand it. Verse 27. It was in the middle of the first passage that I read to you and I promised you I would come back to it. When I dealt with the fowls of the air and the lilies of the field, I'll close with this. I want you to look, if you will, in verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Well, that must have been pretty important. And that must have meant there were some people that wanted to find a way, if they could, to add a cubit to their stature. What would it matter? I mean, I'm not very tall. And you may be very tall. And your height may give you some advantages. But my lack of height compared to you also gives me advantages. For example, I don't hit my head on as many things. I don't have to duck coming under a doorway. But also, I won't be playing professional basketball. So there's advantages and disadvantages. But for some reason, they must have been obsessed with that. Or why would Jesus had mentioned that? He's talking about your height. That's what he's talking about. Your stature, your height. They wanted to add to their height, the cubit. Well, I've read it, I've read it. I've studied it, and, and I'm here to tell you, for 40, 42 years, I didn't find anything. Off and on, I couldn't find anything. One day, I'm listening to a lecture from a historian, and a historian, an archaeologist, and in that lesson, he uh, made one brief comment, and he, he just kind of brushed over it, and then he felt compelled to go back to it. And he talked about, Cyrenius cubit. And I thought, what's Cyrenius cubit? And then as he began to speak, I started to understand. He said, when Cyrenius would go in and destroy towns, for example, Sephorus, when he destroyed it, you remember I said he crucified and killed so many? Do you know what he did with the others? Took them as slaves. Well, how did he decide who to kill? And who to take as slaves. I mentioned the number of Jews. That's just because of Jewish history. But it was a multinational city. There was a lot of others that were killed that day. Crucified too. They didn't spare nationalities. Because they felt like anybody. First of all those that were in the city. Let it happen that the zealots took it over. And second of all they were all considered an enemy to the empire. And they destroyed the enemy. If what they didn't kill they took into slavery. Now you can find a lot of different figures. I found as many as 70,000 that were taken into slavery. And I've seen as many as just 
maybe 3,000 to 5,000. But how did they decide? You'll be a slave and you're going to die. You know how they decided it? Would you like to know? Cyrenius Varus, Quintilius Varus, said this height, take one cubit, half a cubit below it, half a cubit behind, above it. If they are more than half a cubit above it, kill them. If they are less than half a cubit below it, kill them. So your goal was to be in Cyrenius cubit. Fit in. You wanted to fit in to what he wanted because your life, even though you'd be a slave, you'd, you'd be spared. So the idea was this, if you were below it, you were concerned if they ever came to my city and destroyed it, will they kill me because I'm not tall enough or I'm too tall. That's what they did to the men. They took them, slaughtered them based on their height, based on where they fit in. I don't think you hear what I'm preaching tonight. Too many people are trying to fit in to this world. Let me make this clear to you. I don't fit anymore. And I don't want to fit. I know I don't fit. I know I'm a misfit in this world, but I know I fit in heaven. And I know that when he calls me, I'm ready to go. I'm not trying to get adjusted to this world. And I'm not trying to get used to the things of this world. I'm trying to stay and continue being what God wants me to be. God has made us the way he made us for a reason. And God wants us to be used for his glory but you cannot be used for God's glory if you're too busy trying to fit into the world. I don't fit in and I don't apologize for not fitting in. In fact, I'd be worried if I did fit in. It's not that I'm better than anyone else. It's a thing that you make your mind up. Do you see how it all flows together? He's saying, you got to be focused on putting more in heaven than you do in earth. And then you got to be focused, shot like an arrow, determined I'm going to heaven no matter what. Because if not, you're just going to go everywhere and be everything. And finally, he says, don't you understand you're not going to fit in in this world. That's what he's telling his disciples. You're not going to fit into this world. I don't care what you do. You're just not going to fit in. So he said, you cannot add to it or take away to fit in. What he's stressing to us there is that if we have Jesus, we're just the right height. You can't add to it and you can't take away from the gospel. It'll be okay if you have Jesus. A little boy sat in a class one day and his teacher was teaching, Sunday school teacher. The teacher said, anyone have any questions? The little fellow raised his hand, I've got a question. And the teacher said, yes, what, what is it, son? Well, how tall was Jesus? Well, we don't know how tall Jesus was. We, we know that there's some idea. I've read some things. The teacher said maybe his average height said maybe even six feet tall. And the little fellow said, how tall am I? The teacher said, you're about four feet tall. And he said, you mean Jesus could have been six feet tall? Yeah. And I'm four feet tall? Yeah. He said, well, it seemed to me like if Jesus is in me, he ought to be sticking out everywhere. And that's exactly right. We can never fit in to God's plan and we can never make it to heaven without Jesus. Don't you see it? It's focus, focus, focus. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's no other way except Christ. And you're not going to fit in. But if you're trying to fit in some other way, you ought to say, Lord, I'm not doing it my way. 
I'm doing it your way. I'm going to ask them to come and get a song, whatever they have tonight. And I pray, I pray, if you've been busy trying to fit in to everything around you and you've left Jesus out, you've lost it all, friend. Without him, we have nothing. It destroys, it vanishes, it's here and it's gone. But with him, we have everything. I hope you're looking to him. I hope your eyes is focused on him. I hope your mind is on heaven greater than it's ever been before. We're just about there, church. We're almost home. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Any day, any moment, Jesus is going to come. I'm telling you, we're so close to his coming. Yes, sir. I get chill bumps every time I think about it. I just think he's almost on the golden threshold of heaven, ready to shout, come on home, church. We're there. Keep your eyes focused on him. Because without him, you can do nothing. But with him and through him, all things are possible. As he sings, if you need to pray, what a wonderful time to talk to the Lord. God bless My you. home may not look like a castle. My clothes may be lacking in style. And if you come sit at is so sweet tonight and I pray that as you have worshipped God in spirit and in truth you've experienced the nearness of Christ and his love for us he loves you you're more precious than the fowls of the air you're more precious than the lilies of the field you're more precious than gold and silver you're more precious regardless of your height Regardless of where you're at in society, he loves you, friend. Thank you for worshiping together with us. I don't want you to miss our worship on Sunday morning at 9.30. I'm telling you, I believe there's a glory cloud going to settle in. And we just have to seek God as never before. Pray that God will continue to use us and that God will bless our efforts for his glory. 
And we thank you for praying for us. We look forward to worshiping together with you again Sunday morning at 9.30, again Sunday night at 7.30. God bless you. You're dismissed.